Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, and we're going to read till chapter 6, verse 2. Robin's going to read for us. Robin? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Thank you. You've got your Bibles open to 2 Corinthians, we hope. Let's begin. You ready to begin too? Okay. You can join us. <laughs> there was a large number of tax collectors and sinners coming to Jesus to hear what he had to say. The Pharisees and scribes were there also, and they were complaining because... He did not turn any of these people away. Jesus spoke into a parable to them. He said, A man had two sons, a younger son and an older son. And the younger son one day came to the father and said, Father, give me my inheritance now. So the father divided his wealth, and he gave his son, his younger son that is, his portion. A few days later, the younger son packed up everything that he had, and moved away. The younger son's life was filled with wasteful and meaningless things. Soon, he had spent everything his father had given to him. The economy turned bad, and he found that the only job that he could be employed at was feeding pigs. He soon realized that as he was feeding the pigs, the pigs were eating better than he was, and he never received a chance to even eat what the pigs were eating. It dawned on him one day that his father's servants had enough bread to eat, so he decided to return home. Upon arriving, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Please, make me one of your servants. And the father took the son and restored him. This is a picture of of reconciliation. People are being reconciled through Christ to God. Now I know if you're familiar with that parable, there's a little bit other stuff that's going on. But I wanted you to see that picture of two people who are estranged and then returned back together. Over the last few weeks, we have covered the power behind reconciliation which is the love of Christ, which compels us. We've seen the basis of reconciliation, which is the new creation. Today, our attention is on the proclamation of reconciliation. And our outline should reveal and see just that. So we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, and we're going to look all the way to chapter 6, verse 2. Because remember, our, <laughs> our chapter divisions in the Bible are man-made. Sometimes they don't fit the flow of the argument of the writer. And to begin with, our first point is the position of every believer. We'll see that in verse 20. Then we'll see the, the practice of every believer, which is in verse, again, still in verse 20. And we'll also move down to 6.1. And finally, the proclamation of every believer. 5.21 and 6.2. Each believer is appointed to the ministry of reconciliation. Each believer, that's all of us. This is the ministry that you've been given. Oftentimes we spend a lot of time, a lot of effort trying to figure out what's the ministry that God has called me to? Singing, pre... No. All of us have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. There's no special requirement to serve in this ministry. 
And in fact, everyone is expected to participate. So it'd be a shame for a church to turn someone away and say, you cannot participate in this area. Everyone is to. So let's begin with our very first point. The position of every believer. In 520, he says, now then, we have this transitional conjunction. Now then, or so then, or therefore. And it carries the meaning of consequently. So Paul is saying, consequently, or by the way, or so then, or therefore, we learn that each one of us is an ambassador. So what is our role and our responsibilities if we are ambassadors? And for many of you, maybe this is the first time you've heard that you are an ambassador for Christ. If we begin with just the idea that what is the role of an ambassador, the role of the ambassador is to represent his country while living in another country. The believer, we are told throughout the New Testament, is a citizen of heaven, right? We are temporary residents of earth. That means we are renters, even if you're a homeowner. We rent. We're transient. <laughs> that's a word we may not like to have, but that's what we are. We move around from place to place is the idea. Because our main home is there. That's where we're supposed to focus our attention upon. The ambassador is to represent the other country here. The ambassador also represents his leader while he's living in a different culture. Ah, ah, you and I are to represent Jesus Christ to different cultures in which we live in. Right off the bat, that should tell us you and I should not be the frog in the pot. We should not become so accustomed to the culture that we live in that there is no distinction between us and the culture that we live in. Because if we are representing Jesus Christ, does he look like, does he sound like, does he act like the culture in which we are temporarily living in? No, he does not. In fact, he did not in the first century. So you can bet your bottom dollar that he doesn't in the 21st century. The ambassador does not speak of his own. He does not act on his own authority, nor share his own opinions or demands. He speaks as he has been told to speak. So as the role of the ambassador, that is your role. That is my role. We say, well, what am I to speak? What am I to share? What am I to say? You will never run out of words because you have the Word of God. You will not have to make up your own words because the words have been given to you to say. And in fact, the greatest words that you have received are the words about how Christ came and transformed and changed your life. Your testimony. And we'll get a little bit more about that in just a moment. So that's the role of the ambassador. But what are the responsibilities of an ambassador? The responsibilities of the ambassador is to speak with authority in the name of the one he, rep he or she represents. So when you speak with authority, huh, it's not like, well, would you like to? No, it's I am representing this individual and this is what they say. His authority comes from Christ himself. And as one with authority, that means you have some power. You have the ability to pardon. You have the ability to offer peace. What do you mean? Well, to start off with, as an ambassador of Christ, it is your responsibility to offer pardon of sin. You're thinking, well, how is that possible? I cannot forgive sin. You cannot forgive sin. I am bringing information to you, the unsaved world, how they can have their sins forgiven. Many people struggle mentally their whole lives trying to deal with sin. 
How about peace? As the ambassador, you have the authority to bring peace. In the New Testament, we find that, and also throughout the Old Testament, we are at war. Mankind is at war with God. There's hostility between mankind and God. You might say, well, that's, I was never angry at God. I was never mad at God. Oh, then you're not listening to what Scripture says. Why we were hostile is the idea towards God. He sent Christ to die on the cross. He loved us. Look at Romans 5, 8, and you'll see that nice and clear. But there's also the power. We are offering the power of eternal life. Ambassadors, this is what you and I have to do. It is not like we are, have a magic stick and going ding, ding, ding. It's we are presenting this great information, this great facts to people that will transform and change their lives. Was not your life changed when you found out that how you could have your sins dealt with and how you had peace with God and someone finally told you this is how you can have eternal life? Yeah, it was. Radical change, wasn't it? What happened? Did we become soft and over time? Did we forget who we represent? Did we lose the focus of that we are ambassadors to tell people about this? Well, the ambassador is the sovereign voice of God that he represents. So when the ambassador pleads with someone, it's the equivalent of the voice of God speaking to that person. And I've never considered that for a moment in my life, but the more I've thought about that, I'm going, I am amazed in the process of thinking of this. Have you considered that? As the ambassador, when I share the good news of Jesus Christ, the unbeliever is receiving a message from God through me or through you, and it's an offer that is, an ex that is expecting an answer. If the person that's hearing the message accepts, what happens? If the person rejects the message, what happens? Neither changes my position as the ambassador. I'm just responsible to tell. And I am sharing the most powerful being in the universe's word to others. I don't know if that, what that does for you, but I, I, I'm pretty, pretty psyched up about that. I'm pretty amazed by the fact that that's really what's going on. And from Paul is trying to tell the Corinthian believers, folks, this is what's taking place. Are you aware of what's going on? So that's empowering and emboldening the Apostle Paul when he says, I've got a message it's from God. I'm sharing it with you. Whether you say, I don't want to hear it or I do want to hear it, Paul says, this is God's word that I'm delivering to you. Great motivating factor. So we lay right out there. This is the position that Paul says every believer has. Back in verse 20, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. But what is our practice? Well, the practice of every believer, there are two things the ambassador is to practice regarding his or her communication skills. First, there is a persuasion. We try to persuade people to listen. And then there's a plead for decisions. You're still in verse 20, but Paul says, We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. Skip down to 6.1. It says, Then as workers together with God, also plead with you. So you get that idea, you, you hear that idea in both things, that there is an idea in which we are to persuade people to listen. The phrase, as God was making an appeal through us, it's very interesting for us to look at. For the word appeal or plead comes from the Greek word parakaleo. Now you're thinking, who cares about that? Well, I, nobody, unless you're like into Greek language and all that kind of stuff. But this word carries an idea of inviting or coming to the aid of somebody, helping or comfort. Now I'm going somewhere with this, so just hold on a second. 
Now, when Jesus was talking to the disciples and he was getting ready to leave, he told the disciples, I'm going to the cross and I'm going to die. And the disciples really weren't having anything to do with this. He says, but I'm not going to leave you as, as orphans. I'm going to send another helper. I'm going to send another person who is going to be with you. And that other comforter in John chapter 14, verse 16, he is going to abide with you forever. And that word that he uses there is parakaletos. It is the, the noun form of parakaleo. What he's saying there is just simply this. The Holy Spirit is this one who comes alongside and he helps. He invites. He encourages. Jesus came alongside men and women and he turned their hearts to the Father. We must come alongside people also. And this speaks of a connection that must exist in relationship form. And that has to shape the tone of our message. There's a couple things we can decide to do. And I know these things work. We can stand on a corner and say, you're all going to hell. And you know what? You might get one or two people that will go, okay, you're right. And at that moment, that person feels convicted. And a whole bunch of people will walk by and go, you know, crazy people those crazy religious fanatics yep but the apostle paul here the same thing that jesus when you come alongside people and because you've built up a relationship with someone you urge them as if people were pleading through god going back to the same thing in verse 20 as through god we're pleading through us and imploring on christ's behalf it is the idea of going it is so important for you to be reconciled and have your relationship restored with God. I want to encourage you. I want to per persuade you and tell you all the good things that will take place. By the way, if you get right with God, let me tell you how your life will change. You'll have your sins forgiven and you'll have your guilt dealt with. Oh, by the way, you'll feel a sense of peace that passes all understanding that inner turmoil that you're trying to deal with on a regular basis and you can't find no matter what you try. You've tried drugs. You've tried alcohol. You've tried sex. You've tried pills. You've tried other relationships. You've, tr you've tried everything. You've tried a psychologist. You've tried everything, but nothing helps. Because you need peace with God. God can do that. And what about life? God can give you eternal life. So this is not the end. This is the beginning. Your life is not over. It is just beginning. And he came, you might have life more abundantly. And for eternity. So I'm persuading is that idea. I want to invite you to come and know who Jesus Christ is. And it comes through the cross... Not the picture here. It comes to the cross. Because Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Now that's exclusive. I know the people in our day and age, they don't like to hear that. We want many ways. We want choices. Here's the choice. Choose Jesus. And Paul says, is through you. As if God is working through you Pleading with people. Persuading people. This is the better choice. Choose this. Yep. That's what we're to do. In order to do that, we have to come alongside of people in a relationship form. So they want to hear us. Does God want our family, our friends, our co-workers and people that we come into contact to be reconciled to Him? Yes. So what tone is the message of God. And what should it sound like as it comes through us as we are appealing to the unbeliever? That's, I bring that out. So I implore, I beg, I ask, or I request at the direction of Christ that you be reconciled to God. 
Paul speaks before Festus and King Agrippa. Turn to chapter 26 of Acts. We'll come back here, but this is such a, an amazing and wonderful story. that You need to hear this for yourself. Acts 26, 26, 26. In Acts 26, this is one of those long events in the Apostle Paul's life where he is, this is the countdown to his death. This is the long road where he is going to die. It's just that long time ago, Jesus said, I'm going to show him what things he's going to suffer for my namesake. And I'm going to bring this guy, Paul, before kings. And lo and behold, here's Paul towards the end of his life, and he is doing just that. He's coming before kings. So, in chapter 26, verse 26, it starts with this. He says, For the king before whom I also speak freely, he knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things have ex has escaped his attention since the thing was, done, was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then King Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Oh, King Agrippa. Oh, to God that you'd become a believer. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might, might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except, of course, for these chains that are holding me. So Paul is trying to persuade Festus, who's with Rome, and King Agrippa, who's of Jew, Jewish descent, and, and looking and going, I am trying to convince you people that Jesus is the way. The desire to persuade these men because the love, the love of Christ pers, uh, compels the Apostle Paul to stand before them. And notice the Apostle Paul, he's looking for a decision. When he says, do you believe? I know you believe. There's nothing wrong with asking people for a decision. So Paul, and we see he's persuading people to listen, to hear, but also plead for a decision. The challenge to be is to be active. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Then as workers together with him, so the Apostle Paul recognizes that we work with God in sharing the gospel. We're the ambassadors, we're the representatives, we're going out and telling, God's doing the work, and we get to be, go alongside and work with him. He says, also, I plead with you, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Well, what does he mean by that? How can a believer fail to profit from the grace of God? Well, turn to chapter 7, verse 1. He says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Letting the grace of God that we've received run and be in vain would be, of course, <laughs> letting filth be in our flesh. Letting filth run through our life. Chapter 12, verse 20, still in 2 Corinthians. Verse 20 says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you as I wish, and I shall be found by you as you do not wish. Lest there be contentions and jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, whispering, conceits, turmoils. Oh, by the way, this is in the local church. This is the character of people in the local church. So church is filled with people who are sinners, right? Like us, right? I'm on. You too. It's okay. This is an AA meeting, but I mean, we get the point. Verse 21, it says, Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and, can, and have not repented of uncleanliness, fornication, and lewdness, which they have practiced. Look, you receive the grace of God in vain. The grace of God is to transform and change your life. And you're not changing. God has given you all this stuff, and you are continuing to sin. So you go back to Romans. Shall grace continue? What shall we say? Shall we? Well, let me go back to 6. Go back to chapter 6 in Romans. Since for whatever reason, I cannot grab verse 1 and 2 together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
No, is really the answer. Never let it be. Certainly not. How, sh- how can we who died to sin live any longer in it? That's the point that the Apostle Paul is trying to make. If we do not practice our faith, a gap grows in our conduct. It's like being on a boat that's supposed to be tied to a dock. As soon as what happens when the, when the boat is not tied to the dock? I should ask the professional that's here. You know, those, those who are dealing with ships and dealing with stuff, what happens when that boat is not tied to the dock? It drifts, right? What happens when your faith is not tied? You start to drift. Right. So, asking for a decision, it's really biblical. In Luke chapter 8, 28, go ahead and turn there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to turn to a few passages because I want you to see this. So when we're looking and asking someone to make a decision for Christ, it's not unbiblical for us to do this. It's not unbiblical when we share as ambassadors of Christ to say, hey, we're trying to persuade you to believe. And our persuasion is not with manipulation. It's not with fear. It's not with trickery. It's just here's the facts. Would you like to believe this? In, in Luke chapter 8, verse 28, the same word is used here. He says, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell down before him with a loud voice saying, what have I have to do with you? Okay, that's not it. Uh, where am I? That's a demon possessed man. That's not right. All right. Somehow I missed that one. All right. Go to Acts again. Acts 21. Oh, I see what I did. Okay. Acts 21, verse 39. Paul said, I am a Jew from, from Tarsus, uh, Sicilia, a citizen of no means, and I implore you. Ah. He says, I implore you. Permit me to speak to the people. So Paul is talking to people, and he's asking for a decision there. And whether you think that be be too strange, it's not any different than what happens again back in chapter 8 of Acts, Acts 8.34, where Philip is talking to the eunuch and he says, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? So there's nothing wrong with asking for a decision. And we see this again and again throughout the New Testament. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, I'm sorry, my fingers are not finding my passages as quickly. In chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you, and, I have not in- and you have not injured me at all. So the idea of urging is, in other words, I want you to make a decision. I'm pleading with you in the same manner. How does this work? Or what does maybe this look like? Imagine, if you will, uh, something that's very familiar to many of us here. Imagine a young man shows up to, this, to a young woman, and before this young woman, he pulls out this beautiful diamond ring. And he says, this ring represents how much that I love you and how much I care for you. And he tells her that his life would not be complete unless she was to walk side by side with him for the rest of his life. And he gives it to her to, and for her to try on and to see if it fits. And lo and behold, the ring does. And she takes it off and he takes it back. And finally he says, I want to thank you for listening to me. And then he walks away and he returns to his normal life. What's missing? He never asked the question. He laid all this wonderful stuff out to her, and I'm sure she's like going, oh, he's going to ask me, you know, where's the photos for my friends? Okay. But he never asked the question. Right. You've got to ask the question. Every believer, we've got to ask the question. Would you like to believe in Jesus Christ? Now, if they say no, it's not on you. It's not on me. It's not a rejection of you. It's not a rejection of me. 
Stop making it personal like it's you they're rejecting. They are not. You are representing Jesus Christ. If they say no, okay. If they have any questions, they know where to come back to. They'll come back to you and ask. Because you've built a relationship, right? You've given them information and you've asked. Now, if they say yes, there'll be some celebration taking place. Now, the proclamation of every believer, the proclamation, the question is asked, how can we be reconciled to God? The answer really is summarized back in verse 21. So go back to, to verse 21. Because if I finish off at 20, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. But if we were to say, but how does God do this? How in the world can God reconcile people to him? The expanded version of this is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 all the way to the end of chapter 5. And you can read that and study that and go, okay, I see how God does this. But Paul really gives us a short summary in verse 21. And he does so in this simple way. And here it is. It's all laid out for us. In this one verse, we see the person of Christ. He says, for he made him. Well, who's the him? He made Christ. God is the subject and the object is Christ. In John 20, verse 12, uh, 27, he says, now, this is my, my, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose... I came for this very hour. So he made him. There is a direct purpose in which Christ came to this earth for. In John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, You are a king then? And Jesus said, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who hears my, uh, and, and he who is of the truth hears my voice. Romans 3, 25 and 26, God put Christ forward to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So right off the bat, when we look, we see in the person of Christ, he made him. And then we see the perfection of Christ, who knew no sin. Huh. Jesus never experienced any sin. Jesus never had any sin. Jesus never sinned. Now, when Jesus became incarnate, means he took on human flesh, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, Jesus was tempted in all manners, and yet he never yielded to sin. But Jesus never sinned. That causes us to say, well, really? How is that even possible? It's extremely important for us to grasp, because it doesn't say, and Jesus was a sinner. Or he became a sinner. No. It reminds us that he knew no sin. He had no experience with sin in his entire life. That's so important when we're dealing with the propitiation of Christ. That's the idea that God was satisfied by the sacrifice of Christ. To be sin for us. Or on our behalf. Or instead of us. God the Father's character was satisfied in regards to our sin by what Christ by what Christ did as our substitute on the cross. This made you and me savable. God made Jesus to be sin. In this process it didn't mean Jesus became a sinner. You sin and your sin and my sin was accredited, accounted to Christ. Remember John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? How could he do this? 
The only way he could be the Lamb of God that could take away the sin of the world is if he was, going back to the perfection of Christ, if he was perfect, if he was without sin. Because a spotless lamb was required to remove sin. And Jesus had to die on the cross. That is the only way sin can be dealt with. Not covered up, but removed. If you and I were to sit there and stand there and see Jesus die on the cross, we might say, oh no, Lord, that can't happen, please. Not for us. Don't do this. And it would be heartbreaking for us to see this. I'm not even sure that we could look in Jesus' face as he's dying on the cross. But if that were to happen, he would turn and look down and see us and say, yes, this is how I'm going to deal with your sin. This is how I'm dealing with your sin. Once and for all. Now, do you see the, old, the cost of your sin do you recognize what it's costing now? So the propitiation of Christ was the holy, righteous character of God was satisfied because what Christ did on the cross for you and me. Now this is important because God can't just turn a blind eye and go, oh, I'll, I'll just give you a pass. No. Nope. God's character can't change. It has His right uh, his righteousness has to be met. And in Christ it is. Because he was perfect. And he died as substitute for you and for me. So we find, we move down to the provision of Christ. Where he says, still in verse 21, that we might become the righteousness. The provision of Christ is the righteousness of God. We get credited with the righteousness of God. This doesn't mean that you and I are as righteous as God because none of us are righteous in our actions. But it does mean that when we stand before God, He sees us through Jesus because we're going back to that propitiation, you know when, the, when God's wrath is satisfied, His, His holiness is satisfied because of what Christ has done? Well, all of a sudden now God sees you and me in Him and so the provision that you and I are given, we, are, we get the righteousness of Christ accredited to us. This is a positional truth. So God sees you and says, you are righteous. Ah, and I will treat you as a righteous individual. Therefore, you and I, because we are righteous before God in Christ, you and I can say, Father, he says, yes, son, yes, daughter. I'm always here listening for your voice. I always respond to you. Instead, he says, you don't belong here. Get out. You're not allowed into the heavens. Get out. Each one of you is brought in and said, welcome. It's good to hear you again. And instead of facing his divine wrath, you get His divine favor, grace. Because that grace would be provided for Christ and is provided to you and to me. The last part is the position in Christ. And that last part of that verse is the righteousness of God in Him. That in Him just pulls us back into the concept which we've talked before of in Christ. How does God the Father see us and deal with us? Well, we are in Christ. Christ is the Son of God, therefore you and I are sons and daughters of God by the new birth. All blessings of the Father that the Father has towards the Son are also towards you and I. Many need to change their perspective towards their view of how they see God. This is great news. Because God the Father is a loving Heavenly Father and everything that he does is for your well-being, for your good. He does nothing that's negative for you, all for your good. You might be facing trials and difficulties now, but how is God using that? And so we go running to him, say, Father, this is a situation I have right now. How are you going to work this out? 
trust me, you know, I'll work this out. It will be for my glory, and you will be benefit from this. I don't understand or I don't see. I know you don't. But right now, just hold my hand. Hold my hand and walk with me. Trust me on this step now. Just trust me. Keep proclaiming and telling people who I am. The biggest challenge that you and I face is to share the gospel to a society, to a generation that does not know God. But you have been placed here. You have come to First Baptist Church. You have moved into the Walnut Creek, the East Bay. You have come here for whatever reason. However long you're here, I don't know. But you're ambassadors of Christ and God is calling on you to use you to communicate Christ to others. Will you be an ambassador for him that he's called you to do? Will you use that ministry? And if you say, say I've ran out of people to talk to, then perhaps it's time for you and I to start to pray that God will bring other people into our lives to run across and say, I need more people to come in, Lord, that I might share and tell them that I might represent you in, in my life. That's something that we can all do. It's time for a heart change. People are dying and will die. This is not to manipulate anybody, but we know that we are living in a godless society. Have they heard about Christ? Have your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers heard about Christ? I hope so. And if they have, maybe how can, we, how can you step out outside of that circle? Let's pray. Lord, we pray and we ask that you would give us a greater heart, a greater capacity for those who do not know you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being your ambassadors. What we've learned today and heard takes a great weight off of our shoulders as we see that all this is done through you and you've called us to this wonderful ministry. The burden is not upon us and using some sort of special speech. You're just asking us to be ourselves and to share how you changed and transformed our life. That's something that's pretty simple that we all can do. Lord, we ask that you would use us to make an impact for you, not to start a revolution or anything, but just that you might be honored through our life. So this week, Lord, help us to honor you and be aware each time that we are honoring you, that we might praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.